the mean pinball. He's the man who made Elton John, Justin Timberlake, and Britney Spears look their best in concert. Now lighting director to the star, Stephen Cohen has turned his spotlight on the theater. Producing Stephen Fails his one-man show about a gay Mormon who comes out to his ultra-conservative family. I never felt more alone in my life. I was enamored by the story. We're dealing with some heavy issues, and we do it with a lot of warmth and humor. Confessions of a Mormon Boy is now playing at L.A.'s Coast Playhouse through February 18th. Yeah, I'm Stephen Fales, and I'm the I'm the author. I'm Stephen Fales. I'm the author of Confessions of a Mormon Boy, and uh, it's great to be here in Los Angeles. Now tell me, how did this uh, play come about? Well, I wrote this show for my kids. Um, I was being excommunicated for being gay, and in the Mormon world, you know, that's a pretty bad thing. So I wanted them to know how much I love them. And if something were to happen to me, I was afraid if I were to die there wouldn't be anyone I could fully trust to tell my story. So this came out of this need to tell my kids who I was. And so I wrote the show and started producing it myself around the country. And uh, it just started to build momentum. And people find it not just a Mormon story, but a story that all religions seem to plug in. You know, people will, you know, say, you know, did you steal my journals to write this story? I'm Lutheran or I'm even Muslim, or, or Jewish, or Catholic, it's astounding. So, you know, I played Chicago, Miami, San Francisco, San Diego, New York, but I first premiered it in Salt Lake City. And I figured if I could make it there, I could make it anywhere. So that's where it was born, and then uh, just the response was so huge. So it's great to be here in Los Angeles. There are more Mormons here in LA uh, than anywhere except for Utah, which is kind of fun. Well, the gay Mormons in, in, the, uh, in Salt Lake were really hungry for this. And, uh, you know, a lot of the more conservative Mormons, some of them will venture in and come and see it, and then they'll thank me after the show, and they'll say, thank you for being so generous and not just ripping on the church. Because we're dealing with some heavy issues, and we do it with a lot of warmth and humor, but with a lot of honesty, too. I mean, excommunication in the 21st century for the practice of homosexuality. So that's... Um, you know, I'm raising some big questions about that. Well, before I get ahead of myself, why don't you tell me a little bit about what the play is about? And then why did you feel like you had to get this word out? I mean, what's the, what's the problem that you're trying to bring to the forefront of this? Well, this is my contribution to helping end spiritual abuse in our churches, mosques, and synagogues. And then the link between spiritual abuse and addiction. So the show goes from one extreme of, you know, being the, just the super good Mormon boy to another extreme, you know, where I went to this adolescent phase when I first came out and then finding a middle ground. What is it to be, what does it take to be a good dad and also to stop being a victim? So it's kind of a universal thing. It's not just the gay Mormon, broke back Mormon story. It's, uh, it's I think everyone could get something out of this. Well, my ex-wife's dad was gay and died of AIDS. And her mother, Carolyn Pearson, wrote a national bestseller called Goodbye, I Love You that tells the story. So when I came out, I had married into this very public gay Mormon family. So I thought, you know what, I want to tell this from the man's perspective, from the, the you know, my former father-in-law is not around anymore. So I thought, you know, I think I want to tell this, this side of the story. So my kids are 9 and 11, and they live in Salt Lake, and I live in Salt Lake, and I do travel a lot, but I see them all the time. And um, Emily and I, my ex-wife, um, you know, we're doing pretty well, making a lot of lemonade out of lemons. So where do you think this, where do you see this play going after you're done here in LA? Well, a lot of people say that this should be made into a movie, 
So it's interesting to bring it here to L.A. And, and see what starts to happen. We did film it live off Broadway, but I think a narrative film would be a great thing. And imagine a story with, you know, my mother-in-law and her husband dealing with homosexuality and Mormonism, and then Emily and I dealing with that. I think that, I don't know, I think it's a, a story that needs to be told. And uh, as I greet people after the show, it's not just my story. It's all of our story. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've met a lot of people, you know, Lucy Arnaz loves the show, um, a lot of Broadway actors and stars, Douglas Sills will be here tonight, um, Leslie Jordan is, you know, just a great support to me, I'll call him up and he'll just keep going, Mormon boy, and so, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I'm meeting a lot of people on this journey, I never thought, you know, growing up Mormon, that I would be in this kind of, you know, telling my story like this. But I think it's something I'm supposed to do. And as a Mormon, you know, we're taught to make a difference. And I see that this show is making a difference. So it's been worth it. I was going to ask you, you know, by bringing the subject up to, to the forefront, do you see any differences, say, in the church, like changing some of their thinking? You know what? I think that the Mormon church will come around with this. It is slow, but, you know, they came around with the black issue. Um, they're being little by little more generous, you know, letting women have more of a voice. And I think once the laws of the land change, the church will come along. It's just a precedent, that, a historical precedent. Uh, and, and what are your feelings on uh, the gay and lesbian blog and like religion? Do you feel we're persecuted to all the religions, or just the Mormons? I think that the, the churches and the mosques and the synagogues are missing out on the contributions that gays and lesbians can make in, in the congregation. So there's a, you know, a lot of spiritual abuse happening. We're told that God doesn't love us how we are. But uh, the churches are missing out on all kinds of talent, not to mention tithing, by keeping us away. And we have so much to contribute. And I think they should embrace us and not keep us away. So when you're turned away, where do the people kind of turn to if they can't go to the church? Well, you know, the church was no longer, when I was excommunicated, you know, I bought into this idea that, you know, I wasn't worthy anymore. And so what do you fill your life with when you, when you buy into this idea that God doesn't love you? So there's sex, there's drugs, there's um, materialism. So the second part of my story is when I moved to New York and got swept away um, and started self-destructing. So sometimes we take our spiritual gifts to the streets. And so what is it to reclaim your values and your spirituality and uh, in, even despite the spiritual abuse? What do you want to, my final question, what do you want people to take away with them after they hear this? I want people to come away with this with a sense of possibility. No matter what your past is, you can invent new, you can reinvent your life. You know, as a, as a former sex worker who had, you know, drugs in my past, you know, if I can make my life happen after all of that, what's possible for them? And so that's what I want everyone to leave with. Well, thank you for sitting down with us tonight. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you very much. Is there nothing else? Is there anything? The show. It's going to be all like 45 seconds with the clips and everything else. Steve, are you good with everything? I, I, I think we're good. Is there anything else you want to say? No, I just don't want to get pedantic, you know, or you too are. preachy. No, no, you're fantastic. I think we're great. Great. Good, great. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Judah Mavis. I'm going to get working producer Steve Cohen up there for a couple of yeah. months. So, Steve, I, I know that what you've done, you know, with your life, what you normally do, but tell me a little bit about your background. Like, what do you do? Well, I've, uh, for the past 30 years, I've been in the touring rock and roll business. I've uh, been a lighting and set designer and production designer for, oh, everyone from the Eagles to Elton John. I've worked with Billy Joel for the past 33 years. Last few years, I did some pretty big shows with uh, Britney Spears, uh, NSYNC, Justin Timberlake, Mariah Carey, Ricky Martin, Enrique Iglesias, sort of that, that world of pop and uh, really sort of between them and the, the uh, elder gentlemen, the elder statesmen of rock, like the Eagles and Fleetwood Mac. So you've done all those big things, and now we find you in this small theater here in Hollywood. What you made in your Well, it's a very funny story. And, and what, what had happened was we were, uh, last year, we were mounting the, uh, 
the, the legendary 12 Madison Square Garden shows of Billy Joel's performances in New York. And um, we were basing out of New York City, and I had a few nights off, and I was going through the, the off-Broadway theater listings, and I saw an ad for Confessions of a Mormon Boy. And my partner, Curtis Cox, happens to be Mormon, so of course the bulb went off in my head, and I bought tickets for opening night. And we went and saw the show, and I, uh, I was enamored by the story, and it was very emotional to me, and you know, to Curtis as well. So uh, uh, it, was just, it just resonated with me, and I didn't think much about it. And about a month and a half later, I, I ran into someone in a Yankee hat, and who uh, we were somewhere, and I'd mentioned that I'd lived in Las Vegas, and looked at him, and I said, boy, you look a lot like the guy that was in Confessions of a Mormon Boy. And he says, yeah, that's me, Stephen Fales. So we had a conversation, drinking coffee on Fifth Avenue, and uh, we became friends and talked a little bit. And, and I had spoken to him about the possibility of uh, assisting him in mounting uh, the show later on. I happened to be friends with uh, the Nederland organization. You know, they mounted Moving Out on Broadway. Um, and I just, you know, it was one of those, hey, if I can help you out, I love the show, give me a call. And a few months later, actually six, seven months later, he called. And he said, you know, you remember what you had said about uh, maybe uh, calling the Nederlander organization for me. And we had this conversation, and we talked about the show, and that it was going to be at this great uh, house in, in L.A., which I knew about because I grew up here. And things led to things, and we just sort of said it at the same time, well, why don't, why don't you do it? And I went, well, I've never produced a legitimate theatrical show before, but I know I could cut a really good deal with the lighting designer. <laughs> so... Uh, we entered into this arrangement and uh, headlong into it. And after the uh, holidays, we got together. I had read the script and was moved by the written word and um, what was on the page. And we mounted the show. And here we are. What do you hope that the audience will take away by seeing this? What message do you want to get out there? Well, we all like stories. Stories are what we you know, live our lives through and what, how we sort of judge our lives with other people's stories. And I think this story is really, really powerful. Um, I mean, this is a guy who tried very, very hard to live by the precepts of how he was raised and how his family and his ancestors were raised. And he tried very hard to do the right thing uh, for his church, for his wife, for his family, and um, was, uh, was rejected. Um, you know, for whatever reason, that's, that's what happened. And um, I, I know that for me, um, uh, having been rejected in my life, uh, it takes a negative toll. And somewhere down the line, it, it, it affects you. And you do things that maybe you wouldn't naturally do uh, if you were accepted. So uh, I, I related to that story uh, as it affected my life. And um, uh, the more I've seen it, and the more I get to understand the script, I've been in every performance since we, we did, started previews last week, I, I learn a little bit more and more about the nature of these things that we all go through and how much this is a universal story. So I, I just think it's a, it's a great story. And it's funny. You know, we realize that our common, our common uh, uh, the things that happen to us in life are pretty funny. <laughs> so when you share those stories and get laughter at it, you go, hey, my life is pretty funny too. Well, I mean, I, I think it's out there. I think it's out there a lot. And I think it, uh, it uh, politically changed an election four years ago. And I think that we were very much a topic in politics. And I believe that, um, you know, one of the things that happens when you get to know a certain person is that the preconceived ideas of who they are and what they stand for aren't what you've been told. And uh, with education.